In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sermon text for us today here on Transfiguration Sunday is from the Gospel lesson, Matthew 17, verses 4 through 8. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, we'll make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He was still speaking, when behold, a bright light, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified, but Jesus came to them and touched them, saying, Rise, have no fear. When they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. So far, text. A few things about this text. Peter, James, and John go with Jesus up on this mountain a week after, six days. The text says six days after Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, where he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. After that, Jesus foretells his death and his resurrection, to which Peter says, oh, oh no, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen. And Jesus rebukes Peter and says, Satan, get behind me. You have in your mind the things of men and not the things of God. Then Jesus tells his disciples, If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Then, as, then we get to the transfiguration. Jesus takes with him Peter, James, and John up this mountain by themselves. He's transfigured there. Moses and Elijah appear. They come down from the mountain. The Gospel of Matthew tells us that Jesus heals a boy with a demon. For some reason, the disciples couldn't drive out. And then he does this. He foretells his death and his resurrection again. So sandwiched in between Jesus foretelling his death and resurrection, Peter confessing that he's the Christ, and Jesus again foretelling his death and resurrection, we have this mountaintop experience, the transfiguration of our Lord. Now, both times, Jesus tells of his death and his resurrection, and the disciples lose their minds. They get distressed, and understandably so. Nobody likes to talk about death. It's a real mood killer in many ways. Uh, No one wants to talk about their impending death or the impending death of their loved one. For years, whether you know it or not, we have a funeral planning guide here at Mount Calvary, and every Easter season, we afford the opportunity for members to come in, sit in in a workshop, and help go through and plan their funerals. It's good for us, it's good for their family, good for the funeral homes as well. Now, usually we only have a handful of people who attend. I get it. And even less fill out the forms. I think it's because of this. I have a hunch that when we're forced to think about something or do something, we really don't want to go back to it. And many of us have been forced to think about death, deal with death of loved ones, and it happens at the most inconvenient of times. We've all been forced to learn about death, its unwelcome surprise, its ugliness, its utter pain. And then the result of it, well, we just don't want to think about it. Or, if we do think about it, we try to avoid it at all costs, and do everything we can to stay death. And the disciples, they're no different. Peter rebukes Jesus for telling him, giving him a teaching about death, that he will suffer and die and on the third day be raised. Then again again in Galilee, Jesus tells them that he'll be handed over into the hands of sinful men and they will kill him and on the third day he will be raised. And both times they're greatly distressed. They didn't want to talk about death, but Jesus did. These two foretellings of Jesus' death and his resurrection, ah, They just had to be a mood killer for these disciples. Think about it. Jesus is 33 years old. He's in the prime of his life. They're going around with Jesus to all these different towns around Galilee and Judea and into Samaria too. All these crowds of people are following him. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear and the dead are raised up. And the good news is preached to the poor. They know it's Jesus Christ. It's a mountaintop experience one day after another for them hanging out with Jesus. All of his miracles, his prophecies must have made their minds race at what new and great miracle Jesus had in store for them or what great teaching he had. Maybe he would defeat the Romans and free the yoke that the Romans had put upon the people of Israel and he would, he would save the nation of Israel. 
Maybe, maybe Jesus would take on all the corruption of the Pharisees and the Sadducees there in the temple and do away with this overarching temple tax that they imposed. Maybe Jesus would unify all the different 12 tribes of Israel again and usher in this new and great era for the nation of Israel. Maybe Jesus would be handed over into the hands of sinful men, be killed, and on the third day be raised, just as he said. Now which of these options of maybe what was going through the disciples' minds would have been the greatest for them in their standpoint and experience in life. Now, at first take, Jesus, his death, his resurrection, appears to be the least attractive option, probably, for the disciples to think about. So, instead of dwelling on death, Jesus encourages these three guys, Peter, James, and John, to think about heaven by giving them a little glimpse into heaven sandwiched in between these two occasions of Jesus telling them about his impending death and his resurrection. So they might get the fullness of what that means for them in the hour of their death. He strengthens them in their faith, what they're going to need for the hour that is to come, by giving them a little glimpse into heaven. I think there's a lesson for us in this as well. That as death approaches us, there is comfort to be had in this yearning to look into these things of heaven. Now, I, along with you, often wish that the Bible would tell us more about what heaven is like. Oftentimes in scripture, scripture heaven is described to us in, in negative terms, like from Revelation, a place where death shall be no more. Neither there shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, for the former things have, have been gone away. Now, we don't get all these details of what heaven is like just as we want, but we know this. We know that heaven is good. We know that it is a place of, of bliss. And Jesus is there ruling with all of his power, with all of his glory, with all of his might, and we want to go there, but not quite yet. Peter, James, and John received this vision into heaven, and they even heard this conversation therein. Now, much like the details of what heaven is like. We don't know the details of this conversation of what Moses and Elijah and Jesus were, were talking about. Maybe they were talking about all the uh, long... Maybe what they were talking about was along the lines of what the author of, of Hebrews says when he wrote this. He said that they, they serve as a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. Moses gave the instructions for the tabernacle and for what eventually became the temple. Elijah was given the words of the Lord and the power of the Lord to prophesy. Now, the tabernacle and the temple in Jerusalem, they served as this. They served as a copy or as a shadow of the heavenly things. So think back in, in your minds of, of what Moses, what God, through Moses, instructed to be put into the tabernacle. Cherubim angels, gilded in gold. Gold everywhere. A lampstand made of gold, seven-lighted lampstand. A table of showbread from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Twelve fresh loaves of bread every day, the aroma of it. An altar of incense, sweet-smelling incense, that the priest would light as he brought the prayers of the people into God's presence there. So a sweet aroma of incense. Roasting meat at the brazen altar just outside the tent. The smell of a barbecue day and night inside and outside of the temple and the tabernacle, vibrant colors. All of these things were, were copies of the heavenly reality, the author of Hebrews says. And the Old Testament Jews, well, they didn't even have the revelation of St. John into heaven yet, so if they wanted to know what heaven was like, if their minds ever wandered down that path, huh, I wonder what it's like in heaven, they would look to the tabernacle. They would go to the temple and understand that's what heaven is like because they knew that God dwelled there in that place. But then Jesus, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit and was born of the Virgin Mary and was made man. You get it? In Jesus, heaven came down to earth 
when Jesus came down to earth, then in his ministry, in his preaching and teaching, his healing and fulfilling, he connects these two dots between the copy and the shadow of the heavenly things here on earth and himself who is in heaven as he comes to earth. He says things like this, I, I am the bread of life, stating that he is now the table of showbread in the temple. He says things like this, I, I am the light of the world, stating that he is the seven-lighted candle stand, the menorah that resides in the, in, the ta- in, the, in the holy places and gives light to all of it. He says this, ask anything you wish of the Father in my name, and he will give it to you, stating that he himself is the, the altar of incense with aroma of prayers in his name. He says this, baptize all nations in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, stating that he is the bronze laver, this wash basin outside the temple that was used for ritual cleansing for anyone and anything that came into the temple. He says, he says I and the Father are one, stating that he is the presence of God as the presence of God resided in the Ark of the Covenant. He says, I, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me, stating that he and he alone is the only way to heaven because he is the only one who has come down from heaven. Now, we don't know what all these conversations that Jesus had with Moses and Elijah up on this mountaintop. We just know that the three of them came from heaven to earth upon that mountaintop where Jesus was transfigured. And Peter, James, and John saw them, and they they heard them, and they wanted to stay there looking into heaven. But not just the copies, the shadows of heavenly things, but the actual heavenly things. They could not stay there. They could not keep seeing that vision and hearing that blessed heavenly conversation. It wasn't their time. Now, certainly this mountaintop experience with its vision, its sights, and its sounds served to strengthen the faith of the disciples. But this account and this experience, it wasn't just for them. It's for you too. Jesus told them, tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And like so many other times in Jesus' ministry, in essence, he had to say this to his disciples. He said, wait, wait and learn more about me and what I'm fulfilling and what I am going to do so that you will understand the fullness of why I had to come down from heaven to earth to live, to die, and to be raised again on the third day. So, Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, for your comfort, and so that you might know the fullness of God's love for you in Christ Jesus, there is still a copy and there is still a shadow of the heavenly things that Jesus gives to you here on earth to serve to comfort you and strengthen your faith for when that hour of your death comes. Now in the Old Testament, this was accomplished by the the sacrifice of the blood of calves, of rams, of sheep, of goats, all mediated by a priest there in the holy places of the tabernacle and the temple. Now in the New Testament, it's not accomplished by that, but it's accomplished by the bread and the wine by the body and blood, not of a goat or a ram, but by the blood of the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the whole world. And this Lamb of God is also the mediating priest bringing to you this new covenant in his blood that was shed once and for all. And so if you, like Peter, James, and John, long to look into this, the heavenly things and see what heaven is like, and the Roma's there, And the conversation there, your vision of it is not very far away from you. In fact, it's right here before you as heaven is opened before you. And all those who dwell therein with Jesus come down from the mountain, or come down from heaven down here to the mountaintop called Mount Calvary. For when the bread and the wine are together lifted up in this holy conversation that Jesus has granted to us, And with the words of Jesus, the bread and the wine become his very body and blood, given and shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Heaven is open to you. Not, and you don't just get to to put up a tent there and stay a while at a distance listening to a conversation of heaven while you see the sights and the sounds. You get to come to the heavenly banquet table that has no end. 
You get to dine with saints and with, with angels and all the company of heaven with Moses and, and Peter and Elijah and James and John. You get to dine with your grandma and your grandpa, your husband or wife, your child or, or your children who have gone before you into heaven and all of your friends who are with Christ in bliss everlasting. You get to hear the angels sing, holy, 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 this chorus that you get to join in with them here below. You get a taste of, of the fare laid upon that heavenly banquet table that has no end. As you, by faith, get to see your loved ones in heaven, here on earth, and for those of you to whom this reality has been revealed, there is no other place on earth you would rather be you see, then here, or there, at the mountaintop where heaven is opened for you and all believers in Christ. As the transfiguration of Jesus was given to his disciples to help them understand the fullness of, of why he had to come and, and die and be raised again on the third day, he came to give them and to you this deep understanding of this comfort of his death and resurrection to strengthen you for, well, your upcoming death and resurrection. So Jesus in his supper gives to you this so that you may look to heaven and understand a little bit more about Jesus and be comforted and strengthened and be ready for that hour when your death draws near. For on that day and in that hour and at the conclusion of that moment, you may see now and always what the disciples saw when they lifted up their eyes. Jesus only. In Jesus' name, amen. The peace of God which surpasses all human understanding. Guard and keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We stand to sing the